Nathan Larson started out as a political hopeful running for office in Virginia, hoping to make a difference in the world. But luckily, he didn't win because the difference he wanted to make in this world was horrible. Nathan was a racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, white supremacist pedophile. <laughs> yeah, quite the list. And if elected, he wanted to fight for men's rights, make sure that women were property, legalize child pornography and child sex abuse, incest, and so much more. And this story just gets crazier and crazier. So let me tell you about it. This is the story of Nathan Larson, the pedophile politician, as, as if that narrows it down. <laughs> If you're new here, my name is Elise, and today you're going to see Elise talk about true crime. I post a weekly series here on YouTube called Cleaning and Crime, where I post a cleaning motivation video while at the same time I'm telling a true crime story. But for some, the cleaning footage is too distracting, or maybe you're just not into cleaning. So for you, I post this version, the crime only bonus version of today's story. If you're looking for the original cleaning and crime version, I put a link for that in the description box below my face, or I'll put a little thingy over my head. But if you're just here for a true crime story, you're in the right place. And as always, if you only want to listen to today's story, feel free to check out the Cleaning and Crime podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts. This episode was recommended to me by a YouTube viewer, and your username was mostly letters and numbers. So if that's you, thank you so much for the recommendation. Now, the format of this video is a little different than my others. I usually like to go back and learn as much as I possibly can about the person or people that I'm talking about, their childhood, their past experiences, but nobody has come forward and talked publicly about Nathan Larson or his past or his childhood. It seems that nobody wants to admit that they knew him. They just want to pretend that he never existed. And I cannot say that I blame them. Most of what we know about this guy is what Nathan has shared on social media and his websites, which not a super reliable source. But you know what? We're working with what we got. So also really quick, while I have your attention, this is the home stretch of my incredibly busy summer. I'm spending the next week with my parents and then my daughter goes back to school and then I go full time at my job. And I really want to soak up the last of the summer. And I want to make sure that my brain is in tip top shape full of happiness and relaxation for those things coming up. So I'm gonna take a little break from true crime. I'm thinking it will be two, maybe three weeks, but I don't want to pick a return date because I know my brain and if I pick a return date, I will find ways to work on my next video and I will find things to work on rather than actually taking a break, which would defeat the purpose of taking the break. So I will post in my YouTube community tab and on Instagram and in my TikTok bio when I pick a return date. Now let's get into the story. Nathan Daniel Larson was born September 19th, 1980 in Virginia. And I sadly just don't know much about his childhood. He attended George Mason University and he studied accounting and it's in college that he found his love for politics. He was on the school student senate representing the school of management. And at this time, Nathan said he was a member of the Libertarian Party. Now, Nathan had a bit of an awakening in college, and he really learned who he was as a person. And who that person was was a cocky son of a bitch who thought he was better than everyone else. And he also believed that he was one of the most brilliant thinkers of our time. And he really felt like, if I don't share my brilliant mind with the people, this world is going to fall into despair. And no, I'm not exaggerating. He said that. <laughs> Nathan thought he was so brilliant and he would make such a great politician because he had this ability to think without any emotional involvement. He only used real facts and he could avoid the emotion that gets in the way of good debate. He thought people were too caught up in their own selfishness and they couldn't see the truth right in front of them. And he thought that the world had gotten too soft and he blamed the world getting too soft on the feminist movement. Yeah. So Nathan believed that structured debate and everyday conversations needed to be softened for women's weak and inferior minds. 
So in order to avoid hurting some people's feelings and in order to communicate with women, he believed people had stopped being factual in their debates and conversations and instead just tried to appease other people's egos. And he believed very strongly that this led to widespread social degradation. Nathan was super vocal about how the feminist movement was horrible and ruined everything and basically was the root of every problem in the world. <laughs> and he was passionate. He wanted to spread the word that if we just let white men run everything while women stay home and start making babies as young as possible, everything in the world would just be great. And Nathan really felt that if people would just freaking listen to him, one of the most brilliant thinkers of our time, the world could be set right. <laughs> Stop it. Get some help. Now, in college, Nathan was pretty active in the student senate, and he made his first political headlines when he went after GMU's policies for the punishment of students that were caught possessing marijuana. Now, while he was unsuccessful in his attempts to change the university's policies, he did get a taste of the political scene, and he liked it. We do know that Nathan actually received a couple of misdemeanor charges at this point in his life. One was for use of computer for harassment, which I guess was because he sent lewd emails to a woman when he was in college. And two others were for marijuana possession. So I guess that's why he got so hot on trying to change GMU's policies. In 2005, Nathan Larson got really, really into Wikipedia. And he began very frequently editing many, many Wikipedia pages. I guess his goal in doing this was to make taboo or illegal topics including child sexual abuse, culturally acceptable by editing Wikipedia pages. And he was constantly fighting and arguing against Wikipedia's child protection policy. And he became such a pain in Wikipedia's ass that they banned him entirely in 2008. But he just moved on to other sites like Wikiversity, Wikimedia Foundation, and Rational Wiki. And it's believed he may have been the first person banned from Rational Wiki, too. Dream big. Now, in 2008, Nathan Larson decided he wanted to run for Congress in Virginia's first congressional district. Uh-oh. And he was running as a libertarian. And as he campaigned, he got the opportunity to debate the other two candidates, one Republican, one Democrat. And as a third party candidate, that's super valuable because maybe people don't know him or his views. Speaking of views, Nathan at this point in his political career was pushing for limited government involvement in the public's everyday life, privatizing transportation like buses, and privatizing other things like the U.S. Postal Service. Now, none of those are really crazy. Those are kind of run-of-the-mill libertarian views. But at the debate, Nathan got pretty much laughed off the stage. The debate went poorly. <laughs> When he was asked what he would do to help the economy, he said that he would work towards privatizing many areas of the U.S. government, which would in turn boost the economy. But also to boost the economy, education, public education should be privatized. Oh, oh, and it should be optional. Kids don't need school. And speaking of kids, child labor laws should be abolished. Mm-hmm. Because kids should be able to join the workforce as early as 10. Because some people are ready to work earlier than others. Kids need to be prepared for the real world. And getting a few years head start into the workforce would be great for the kids. And the economy. Kids don't need education. They need on-the-job training. Sir, are you okay? So he got laughed off the stage and he lost the election. Like, people were like, is this guy for real? <laughs> Nathan only got 2% of the votes. He was hoping that the debate was going to help him win over the people. Because remember, he felt that if people would just listen to him, he would fix the world. His loss made him do some deep, deep thinking. And he came to the conclusion that he didn't win because he hadn't gone extreme enough with his political views. He wasn't being true to himself. He'd softened himself for weak and inferior minds. What was he thinking? So he got to work planning his next run in the political game. But then Nathan was emotionally devastated when in the winter of 2008, Barack Obama was elected president. Now, not only was Nathan Larson an anti-feminist libertarian, but he was also horribly racist and a white supremacist. Yeah, he believed only white men should be in positions of power. So now here he is 
can't even get elected to Congress in Virginia, but America just elected the first black president. <laughs> he was pissed. I guess he felt very similarly about black people as he did about women. You know, the weak, inferior minds. And Nathan believed that Barack Obama being elected was going to destroy the world. Like, okay, calm down. This fucking guy. Now, at this time, Nathan was 29, and he was actually living in Boulder, Colorado. I couldn't figure out why, what motivated the move, but that's where he was. And he was so mad about Obama getting elected that he actually wrote a letter to the U.S. Secret Service that said, quote, I'm writing to inform you that in the near future, I will unalive the president of the United States, end quote. He didn't say unalive, but that's the YouTube and TikTok friendly word. You know what I mean? And he went on in this letter to detail how he would assassinate the president. I just don't, I don't understand why he wrote. Like, what did he think? What was the desired result? Was it just for attention or did he expect the Secret Service to be like, oh my God, we got to listen to this guy. He's the most brilliant thinker of our time. I don't know, man, but he did that. And then the Secret Service showed up at his door and they arrested him. And he stood by everything that he said in that letter. He's like, yeah, no, I meant it. Watch out. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's just so stupid. They interviewed Nathan at length and he stood by everything and said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. And there's nothing you can do to stop me. (laughs) But they did stop him. They they threw him in jail. Nathan was sentenced to 16 months and he ended up serving 14 months of that prison sentence. Now, listen, (laughs) prison made things worse. (laughs) Nathan got out after 14 months, and after that, all of his views became more extreme. He was even more anti-feminist. He openly made comments about how domestic abuse is a great way to beat women into submission. He was even more racist and was openly using racial slurs in just everyday conversations. And now he began being very vocally open about being a pedophile. And frequently talked out loud about his desire to engage in sexual activity with children. (sighs) This fucking guy. Okay, this next part may be triggering for some. I'm going to talk in detail about an incredibly abusive relationship that Nathan had with a trans man named Finn, who Nathan actually married. And it's awful. So... If that doesn't sound like something you want to hear about, feel free to skip ahead. I do have timestamps in my description box. So after Nathan got out of prison, he had to go to court-ordered therapy as part of his probation. He went for a short time, and then after a short little while, Nathan ended up sending an email to his probation officer stating that he no longer needed group therapy, and if he were forced to go, he would go on a killing spree. And then he just stopped going. How that isn't a violation of your parole, I I have no idea. I really got hung up on that. Like, why was he not thrown back in jail for that email? What went wrong here? I don't know, man. But while he was in group therapy, Nathan met Finn. Finn was a trans man who was also in Nathan's group therapy. And Finn was there to get help with depression and suicidal ideations and self-harm. And for some reason, Nathan became very fixated on Finn and became obsessed, started manipulating Finn and coerced Finn into a relationship. And they ended up getting serious enough that they got married. Now, Nathan was super controlling of Finn, controlling what Finn ate, what they wore, and even when Finn could go to the bathroom. Nathan also refused to acknowledge that Finn was trans constantly misgendering Finn and dead naming them. Nathan would tell Finn that they were a woman and that their purpose on this planet was to serve Nathan. And that Nathan's sole purpose on this planet was to be with a woman and breed. And once they were married, Nathan began regularly raping Finn, telling them explicitly that Nathan's intention was to impregnate them to produce a daughter so that he could have sex with his daughter. I can't. That... That is very disturbing and upsetting and the worst. Unfortunately, Finn did become pregnant. And something shifted when Finn discovered that they were pregnant. And they decided right then that they needed to leave, if not for their safety, but for the baby's safety. I mean, Finn needed to protect that baby from Nathan. 
This guy's a freaking nightmare. So Finn filed for divorce and applied for a restraining order, which was granted because Finn had tons of evidence, like an email from Nathan that read, quote, It didn't concern me that given my history of raping you, as well as the gravity of what I was proposing doing to the children, I might irreparably destroy our relationship and any prospect of my ever seeing the children, especially unsupervised, end quote. And Nathan admitted in court to emailing that and had raped Finn. Fucking unbelievable. And just like that, the marriage was over. And now that Nathan had all kinds of time on his hands, he started two websites that he owned and operated. One was suiped.org, which I guess was short for suicidal pedophiles. That was a choice. (laughs) And the other was incelocalypse.today. Both websites were removed by their domain hosts. But when they were operational, Suiped lobbied for pedophiles and other sex offenders to be able to unalive themselves legally at clinics. I don't know, man. And Inceloculypse was created to, quote, serve as both headquarters and casual hangout for the hardest core of the hardcore incels, end quote. Now, if you're unfamiliar, the term incel refers to a group of people who have deemed themselves involuntarily celibate, usually implying that feminism and female empowerment has deprived them of the sexual gratification that they deserve. So now that Nathan was divorced, he was even more anti-feminist, even more racist, even more pedophile-y, and now he considers himself part of the incel movement. And he publicly admitted that his views got way more extreme after his divorce. In 2015, Nathan's now 34, and he left Colorado, went back to his home state of Virginia, and moved in with his parents. And he began working as an accountant part-time. And also, he was running his stupid websites. Now, Finn in Colorado went on to give birth to a baby girl. But tragically, Finn ended up taking their own life, leaving the baby with their parents. That is so sad. Now, I'm sure Finn didn't think that this was going to happen due to the restraining order, but Nathan was informed of Finn's death and the existence of his daughter and immediately went about getting custody, which is nuts to me that he could even try. And in October 2016, Nathan went to Colorado Springs and met his daughter. So a convicted felon against whom the other parent had a restraining order while they were alive, who vocally admits to being sexually attracted to children, and even stated that they planned on sexually abusing their daughter, was able to fly and meet her and try to get custody. What? I can't even believe they let him in the same room as that kid. And even when he met his daughter and began court proceedings, he was quoted saying that he doesn't think he would molest his own daughter, but he wasn't sure because he'd never been in that kind of situation before, you see. He also said he believes it's okay for adults to have sexual relationships with children as long as they have consent. (laughs) Uh. Oh, and that the age of consent varies from child to child because some children are precocious. Give me a break. And to top it all off, he went on to say that he also believes incest is awesome. And that if he were to have a son, he wouldn't be interested in engaging in such activities with him. But that he would approve of his son engaging in those activities with, say, a sister or his mother. And he also believed that pedophilia was a civil rights issue and that it should be protected under free speech. He also believes that since he's the man of the house, it should be his choice to do whatever he wants under his roof and raise his children exactly how he wants to. And the way he wants to raise his children is to have sex with them. And he also thought that going to court to try and get custody of his daughter was a way to stand up for the underrepresented, the overlooked minority that is pedophiles. I just don't understand how he can so comfortably just say all of that out loud. Luckily, the jury was disgusted by him, and he was not granted custody of his daughter. 
The judge also said that Nathan needed to see a psychiatrist to do a risk assessment to see if Nathan should even be allowed in a room ever with any child. To which Nathan replied, Oh, I already did that a few years ago, and it was already proven that I am unsafe to be around children unsupervised. But it'd be pretty hard to raise a kid with the constant presence of a social worker, am I right? And the judge just reiterated that, no, you should never be in a room with a child, ever. And you will not, in fact, be raising this child. Goodbye. And he was sent back to Virginia to his parents' house, where he just got mentally worse. In 2017, Nathan ran for office in Virginia again. He ran as a libertarian again, and he did not win again. Then in 2018, he ran again in Virginia, this time as an independent, because the Libertarian Party disavowed him. They were like, oh, that guy? Oh, no, he can't come in. He can't be Libertarian anymore. We don't we don't want him. And the Libertarian Party representative even said that Nathan Larson is disgusting. So the issues that Nathan Larson was campaigning about were that he wants to legalize incest, make it illegal for a woman to accuse her husband of rape, and that pedophilia is a sexual orientation that needs to be a protected civil right. (gasps) So obviously he wanted to be the guy that spoke for the civil rights of these sickos, the sickos that feel the way he feels. He wanted to give them a voice. So, ew. And this was pretty newsworthy. People were shocked. It's, it's shocking. So the local news stations were talking about him, interviewing him. And just to make sure that Nathan's brilliant ideas and brilliant views were easy for everyone to access, Nathan made yet another fucking website, NathanLarson.org, where he posted his campaign manifesto. Because of course, of course he has a fucking manifesto. These guys and their manifestos. It states, quote, I, Nathan Larson, hereby announce my candidacy as a quasi-neo-reactionary libertarian in Virginia's 10th Congressional District election, 2018. As representative, my main agenda will be, one, stopping the war on drugs, two, protecting gun ownership rights, and three, putting an end to U.S. involvement in foreign wars arising from our country's alliance with Israel. I will also restore, four, benevolent white supremacy, Five, private borders. Six, patriarchy. Seven, freedom of speech. Eight, freedom from age restrictions. Nine, suicide rights. Ten, jury trial rights. Eleven, discrimination rights. And twelve, free trade. End quote. I mean, the whole manifesto is disgusting. In my description box and the podcast show notes, I have a link to the entire thing. It was taken down, but I have like a screenshotted way back machine version of it. And also linked, I have a YouTube video from another creator who actually read the entire manifesto word for word. And I will say, because he did so in his video, his video is two hours long. That's how long this freaking manifesto is. So I didn't want to be another voice reading it out loud. But here are some things that made me gasp. He talks about how Hitler was a hero and was, quote, actually a pretty good thing for Germany, end quote. He said that O.J. Simpson did not deserve to be locked up during his trial because his wife got what she deserved as punishment for her infidelity. He says the authority of husbands has been undermined by feminists and that he's surprised that men even get married anymore. He said that Chris Brown was able to avoid the inconvenience of having to murder Rihanna because they weren't married and that using physical violence against her made him more popular. It increased his popularity with female fans because they were impressed that he could keep a woman in line. It's so hard for me to say all this shit out loud. (laughs) And he even blamed school shootings on the fact that so many young boys are fatherless because feminism encourages sexual promiscuity and undermined husbands' authority over their wives. What? And maybe my favorite line in the entire manifesto, quote, guns don't kill people, feminists do, end quote. Christ. 
He also said that white supremacy is a system that works. Oh, and he admires the Taliban. Because if feminism is introduced in Afghanistan, the fertility rate will drop just like it did in the U.S. Gotta keep those women in check. Because increased opportunities for women is very dangerous. Ay, 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 ay. Oh, and he said that the Violence Against Women Act should be repealed, along with all other legislation that interferes with patriarchal rule in the family. Because women are property, obviously. I'm not kidding, it says that. <laughs> property. Initially of their fathers and then of their husbands. He also said that child pornography is an art form and possession of it should be legalized. And because 90% of people prosecuted for possessing child pornography are white, that means that these laws were being used to target and persecute white America. <laughs> he also said that there should be no minimum marriage age because women are fertile before 18. Look, the manifesto is full of racial slurs, anti-Semitism, sexism, and just craziness. It's just full of craziness. Feel free to read through it, but oof. And as you can imagine, it didn't go over well. He was basically laughed out of the politics game, and he withdrew from the election. He then tried to give his support to a different candidate, but that guy was like, no, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> and he rejected his support and said, quote, I'd rather lose than be endorsed by a pedophile, end quote. Good for you. And Nathan left the political world for good. He was still living with his parents. He's pushing 40. And he threw himself into running his various websites and posting on his social media platforms under multiple names. And he was mostly using these incel-based or pedophilia-based websites and his social media to advocate for the grooming of children online, educating readers on how to convince children to send you gross, gross images over the internet. So encouraging sexual performances of minors through grooming and also just word vomiting a bunch of crap about how possession of child pornography should be legal and sexual assault of children should be legal and also women are property and blah, 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 blah. Same stuff as before, just except worse. And now discussion of child grooming and exploitation has been added to the conversation, so. Great. Well, all this talk and these topics, I guess made Nathan realize that he wanted to do these things. So he began creating fake social media accounts, using fake photos, usually putting himself between the ages of 18 and 25. And Nathan started reaching out to young girls on the internet. And he began grooming and grooming and grooming and grooming. Now, Nathan definitely had a skill, which is awful. He was very good at quickly identifying vulnerable underage girls that he could take advantage of. And he would befriend these girls and he would try to convince them to send him photos or videos of themselves. If they didn't agree to send any photos or videos, he would immediately block them or just stop contact altogether. But if they did agree, he would simply collect for his own sick pleasure. And we don't know how many girls that he did this to. But in October 2020, it seems that the images alone were not enough. And eventually Nathan zeroed in on a 12-year-old girl from California that he'd been messaging with for a while. I guess this girl was having a rough time at home. She was struggling with depression. And she said she was not getting the love and attention at home that she craved. So a perfect target for Nathan Larson, who told her that she was beautiful and that she was so amazing and that he understood everything she was going through. Now, he was posing as a 25-year-old. And to make her feel special, he told her that she meant the world to him and that it hurt him to see her so sad and that he could save her. And I mean, pandemic. Everyone was just stuck at home on their computers. So Nathan had a lot of targets and it was easy for him to find young, vulnerable girls like this. So Nathan then convinced this girl to obviously send inappropriate images of herself to him. And then Nathan convinced this girl that she should run away from home and that he would take care of everything and get her to him. Then they could be together 
and he would take care of her. Yeah. And just like that, Nathan began making plans to freaking kidnap this girl. Nathan bought a long wig and sent it to her. And he's like, okay, here's the plan. I'll buy your plane tickets, get to the airport, wear your wig. And while you're wearing your wig at the airport, I need you to pretend to be mentally disabled. Because then people won't want to talk to you. (laughs) This whole case just makes me go, oof. So he was planning to go from Virginia to California, pick up this girl, and fly with her from California to Virginia. Excuse me, to his parents' home in Virginia. What was his fucking plan? Just show up with a 12-year-old in a wig to your parents' house? What was he going to say to his parents? Oh, she she's my friend. And what's this literal child going to think when she shows up to the airport to meet this 25-year-old guy that looks nothing like you and she finds this balding, almost 40-year-old pedophile? (gasps) He's so gross. He's so gross. Anyway, they go through with this bonkers fucking plan on December 14th, 2020. And this girl puts on this damn wig and goes to the airport with Nathan. Now, some sources say... He molested her right there in the airport. Some say before the airport. Some say not at all. No mention of that. Only a few sources said it and I couldn't confirm it. So I would really like to hold on to hope that he didn't get that chance. Then they boarded a plane to Virginia. Now, while they were in the air, a friend of this 12-year-old girl called the police and reported that her friend had met up with an older strange man at the airport. Yes. Thank God. Goodness for that friend. That was so incredibly smart and brave. And it's pretty amazing, but the police acted very quickly. They found evidence on her computer to track what flight she was on with this full adult predator. And the flight they were on had a connecting flight. So they landed at DIA in Denver, where they were quickly intercepted by police. And the girl was reunited with her family back in California. And Nathan was arrested. And hopefully she was given lots and lots and lots of therapy. So Nathan Larson was arrested at DIA and he was charged with attempted kidnapping, child abduction, soliciting child pornography from a minor, meeting a child with the intention of sex, and harboring a minor. February 25th, 2021, Nathan pleaded not guilty to the charges and he wished to represent himself. Idiot. And he wished to use the trial to bring attention to the fact that his rights as a pedophile were being taken away. But the judge was like, no. But then a year later, in March 2022, the judge was like, you know what? Okay, represent yourself. But then like two weeks later, the judge was like, "Ah, never mind, never mind, never mind. And just gave Nathan a court appointed lawyer. And Nathan was shipped off to prison in Arizona, awaiting his trial. Now, because the girl was a minor and Nathan was not a family member, the minimum charge that he would receive was 20 years, and the maximum charge would be life. Beautiful. But I guess Nathan didn't want to sit in prison and await trial. I mean, he couldn't even represent himself like he wanted to. So Nathan just stopped eating. He went on a hunger strike. And get this. He died on September 18th, 2022. He just died of starvation, self-starvation. And in 2023, the charges against Nathan were dropped posthumously because, I mean, he was dead. So, you know. But man, you really got to, you really got to want to just stop eating. I wonder, how long does that take? A couple weeks? God. Not that I feel bad for him, but like, God. (laughs) And that. That's it. That's the whole story of Nathan Larson, that piece of absolute garbage. And look at these photos. This is Nathan in 2008 when he's like, I'm going to run for Congress and I really want to assassinate the president. And then this is a picture from 2021. (sighs) Jesus. He looks like one of those early 2000s videos that were like the faces of meth. And it showed you like how rapidly you age if you do meth. He kind of looks like that. And I'm sorry, but this guy just has like resting pedophile face. (laughs) Tell me I'm wrong. Like I look at that face and I'm like, hmm, pedophile. I mean, right? Hide your kids. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. Inappropriate man. Something, something about him. No, thank you. 
And that is the end of today's true crime story. I know this one was a little different than usual, but man, I just wanted you to know about this awful guy. And I just want to say, it's shocking to me that this guy could run for political office so many times. As a convicted felon, as someone with such dangerous and disgusting views. I guess dangerous and disgusting views can't disqualify you from running for office, <laughs> but... <laughs> But being convicted of threatening to assassinate the president and spending 14 months in jail and having a restraining order out against you for domestic violence and threatening to sexually assault your own daughter? And do you know what's going to keep me up at night? <laughs> In 2017, when he ran for the Virginia House of Delegates 31st district, and thankfully he lost, well, he got 1.7% of the votes. So that was 481 people in just that one little district in Virginia that voted for a man who was openly racist and sexist and anti-feminist and anti-semitic and a pedophile and had a criminal record <laughs> who are these people i mean i think there are a lot of politicians out there that are one or more of those things on that list let's be real but so openly to use that as your platform and fighting to make child rape and incest legal i'm frightened of the people who heard that and said you know what? That's someone who will really represent the people of the 31st district in Virginia. He's got my vote. Jesus, Jones. I hate to be so crass, but I think that Nathan Larson just starving himself and withering away and disappearing was a really good thing for the world. Good for the planet. Think of the children. And that is the end of today's true crime story about Nathan Larson, the pedophile politician. <sighs> He may not have been the only pedophile politician, but he may have been the loudest. If you liked today's story, give me a like, leave me a comment, and also leave me a comment if you have a case that you'd like to request that I cover. And again, I'm taking a little vacation slash break, but I will see you guys again sometime in September. I'll let you know. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.